How many people have ever worked for somebody and you knew that they were disappointed in the job that you were doing, but they didn't tell you what they expected? And you might even ask them, and you, you know, because you knew that they were a little ticked. You know, what can I do to be better? And they're like, I don't know. But they, 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 they couldn't communicate the vision that they had. Well, one of the things that is very clear in these seven letters in the beginning of the book of Revelation, Jesus writes seven specific letters to seven specific churches. Those churches encompass all the churches of all the ages. And in these letters, Jesus is not vague about the things that please him and the things that displease him. Now, how many people think that that's a good thing? Okay, how many people don't want to serve a God where it's a matter of guessing? Is this right or is this wrong? Let me tell you something. God is crystal clear in his communication to his children about what he approves and what he disapproves. Now, how many people want to do what God approves? And how many people don't want to do what he disapproves? Father, we just pray as we look into your word that you would teach us and guide us and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to also invite you tonight. We're going to be, we are at night, we're teaching for a whole hour on the book of Revelation. Tonight we'll be studying, we'll be just studying. Tonight we'll be studying chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. So this is the letter to Thyatira. Um, It's the fourth letter. In verse 18 it says, And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, And Thyatira of all these seven cities in Asia Minor was the smallest city. There was a trade route that went through it, and so they they were a prosperous city. In fact, they dealt with purple dye, which was highly expensive and highly valued in that day and age. And um, so things were financially were doing well in that city. But for the Christians, they had a problem because the Christians um, couldn't bow down um, to idols and except for th- their God, and they couldn't um, eat food that was sacrificed to idols. And in that city, the guilds or the trade unions were tied to different idols. And so they would have their Christmas, not that they celebrated Christmas, they'd have the end of the year party, or they would have a business meeting right in the temple, and they would eat food sacrificed to idols. And it wasn't just eating the food sacrificed to idols. Part of their worship would be things that would be considered sinful to Christians. They involved in different sexual acts and different things that Christians just wouldn't do with a good conscience. And so they had to make a decision. Are they going to follow Jesus or are they going to get ahead in their business? How many people know that Christians should never put business before God? How many people know that there might be times in your job where compromise might be the quote-unquote smart way around the mountain. But Christians don't do what is worldly smart. They do what is godly right. Somebody say amen. As a Christian, we stand for what is right, even if it's not popular or it cost us something on the job. Verse 18 says, Amen, Thaddeus. You sounded like a car squeaking or something. I couldn't do that if I tried. Verse 18, it says, And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and has feet like a burnished bronze. Notice Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God. Somebody asked me why that's a big deal. Do you know of all the names in the, in the Bible, Son of God is used over and over about Jesus throughout the Gospels. But in the book of Revelation, it's only used of him one time. And so this is like jumping out. Like he's calling himself. This is the only place in the book of Revelation he calls himself the Son of God. Now, does anybody have, even the women, have a deep manly godly voice? Say it with me, Son of God. But say it with that will vibrate throughout on the count of three. One, two, three. Son of God. 
Okay, and, and that's the feeling of, of this because he's the son of God and he has eyes of fire burning and his feet are like burnishing bronze and they're glowing, they're highly polished. In fact, it's an interesting word. It's a, it's a word that's hardly used and it means a, a compilation of different alloys that when it's rubbed, it, it becomes shinier than shiny. You know, there's another word I used to say when my kids were younger, but I won't say that here. But the, his feet were shiny, shiny, shiny. And he's the son of God. And he has eyes that are piercing. Like fire coming out of his eyes. And they symbolize that nothing is beyond his view. That he sees all. This this vision is all inspiring. That he sees with piercing, penetrating. He sees everything into the deep recesses of our hearts. Can everybody visualize Jesus, the Son of God, with fire in his eyes, looking straight into your soul? Has anybody ever looked at you, Carrie? And when they looked at you, like, ooh, you just felt like they know everything about me. Jesus is looking at you, and he sees you. Jesus has fire in his eyes. Now, in context, Jesus is about ready to pronounce judgment on this church. But before he does this, it is declared that he has fire in his eyes, that he sees everything about this church. He knows all that is going on. Everybody say, what an introduction. What an introduction to this letter. He opens up the letter, I am Jesus, son of God. I'm saying that seriously. This is like, whoa. It's like, did, I, did you ever meet anybody? And like, you're like, whoa. You know, this is like, this is, this is surreal. This isn't normal. This is out of the ordinary. And my question to you is, do you know that Jesus is looking at you with piercing, knowing eyes, eyes that are flames of fire, It says in Hebrews 4.13 that nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Nothing. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him in whom we must give an account. Verse 19 says, I know your deeds, your love, your faith and service and perseverance. And I know that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Hallelujah. Jesus knows our deeds. Let me tell you something. How many people, we've all felt like, is it worth it? Come on, every mom has felt like that. You know, how many diapers do you have to, you know, if I had a nickel for every time I made you extra whatever, 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 I'd be a rich person, you know, right? Jesus sees your deeds. He sees your love. He sees your faith. How many people are holding on? He sees your faith. Hallelujah. He sees your service. That you're persevering and that you, that you are doing more now than when you started. Now, I got saved in 1976. In 1976, I got saved. Hallelujah. Now, let me ask this question. When I first got saved, I started to really serve God and do kind things, going out of my way. If I was driving down the road and somebody had a flat, guess what I would do? How many people would just do that? It would be like, you're a believer. Of course you're going to do that, Right? Hallelujah. Well, I've been saved now since 1976. How many years ago was that? How many, uh, I don't know, I've been saved for 30, 40 years? I don't know, whatever. However far 1976 is. What? 39. 39 years. I don't even want to admit I'm 39 years old. But 39 years I've been walking with God. Do you know last Sunday we were on our way someplace, and we didn't want to be late for, and we saw this lady over there with a flat tire. So what do you do? You did the same thing you did when you were first saved. In fact, this church did more, and we need to do more. It should never, we should never look back on our beginning of walk with God as the glory days when God really walked with us and talked to us, where we really served God. Amen. We should be continually serving God. And they, Jesus is commending this church for the love, the deeds, their service. Somebody say amen. That's awesome. There's a saying that, um, that I'd like to say, and I want you to think. Do we have this saying, this service, on, on the screen? Yes, put that up there. I want you to read this to me, because this is powerful. The good we do doesn't cancel out the bad that we shouldn't. 
We're about ready to get into this in, 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 as we continue on in this letter. But how many people do good things? All right, that's good. Keep doing them. Do them and do them and do them and do good things. We're good doers, can you say amen? But you need to know that the good you do, don't, don't cancel the bad that you shouldn't. The good you do is separate from the bad that you shouldn't. Now, let me just say this. If you've done bad, there's forgiveness. But you don't get forgiveness for doing bad by doing good. You should do good just to love God. Can you say amen? If you have something you need to repent of, turn away from it. Repent. Forsake that way. Hallelujah. There's grace in Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Jesus wants to forgive you and cleanse you. But your good doesn't bring you forgiveness. Jesus gives you forgiveness. Don't confuse good and forgiveness, grace of God. Can you say amen? We serve a loving, caring, kind God who wants to bring you to the cross and wash your sins away. But you're in deception if you think that your your good covers your bad. Only the blood of Jesus can cover sin. Amen. And I call you to the blood of Christ. I call you to Jesus and say, Father, be honest with God. He knows already. He's got piercing eyes. If there's sin or compromise in your life, confess it. Come to him. You don't need to confess it to me. You need to confess it to the Almighty. Can you say amen? What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. So the good we do doesn't cancel the bad we shouldn't. And this is what he's, Jesus says to him straight up. I love this about Jesus. He's just, he doesn't mince words. How, don't you hate people that beat around the bush? You know what I mean? They, you know they want to say something to you, but they want to be polite. Hey, when it comes to something wrong in your life, if my, if my zipper's down, don't say, you know, Pastor, something you need. Don't you hate that? You know, they, they like, they mime it, and you're like, I don't know what you're doing. I, what does this mean? I don't know. Tell me my zipper's down. I'll zip it up. <laughs> don't be polite about it. It's not polite. I just need to zip the thing. It's not a big deal. It happened to everybody. Come on. Jesus isn't like that. Jesus, if your zipper's down, he comes. <laughs> Why am I keep talking about this? <laughs> Let me read what it says. I'm got down a bunny chair. Bad news here. Verse 20. Listen. It says, but I have this. Now, this is Jesus talking. This is the loving Christ, the one who died for people's sins. But I have this against you. And then he doesn't mince words. That you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. And she teaches and leads my bondservants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Jesus is straight up. You know, in the church, this is a problem. You could, this church, you had a problem. There's this chick named Jez, Jezebel, and she's, she's calling herself a prophet. Hey, she ain't my prophet. She, she says she's a woman of God. And, that she's got all this power. Hey, she might have power. It ain't coming from me. I want you to know, she's an ungodly hussy, and you need to take away. That's what Jesus is saying. He's calling her Jezebel. Do you know what I mean? That's an Old Testament phrase to say she is an unclean, ungodly. Man, there is not a... Her name wasn't Jezebel. He was calling her Jezebel, which was Ahab's wife who brought ungodliness into the nation of Israel. So you have to understand what's happening here. And she's calling herself a prophet. You know, but, and this is, a, this is the bad part, he says to the church. You tolerate her. Now, I was brought up in a, in, a, in, a, in a lifestyle where tolerance was one of our highest values. The, no, seriously, the culture that I was brought up with, that we were, you know, my parents, and they are great parents. I love my mom and dad. They give me so much. But our culture was that we needed to tolerate one another. Everybody's different. You need to love everybody, you know. And there's some parts of it that's great, except when it comes to sin, no, this is true. Do you know I, mean? I thank God that I was brought up without prejudice, without you know, looking down on people for any reason, creed, whatever, whatever, whatever. We were a we were family that loved people and cared for people. But when it comes to sin in the church, we can't tolerate it. Can you say amen? amen. Now, the problem is that the church, for, for whatever reason, was enamored by this woman. Do you know what the word enamored was? It was like, wow. 
wow, Jezebel is like, wow. She spoke in such a way that made people feel good. She was able to motivate people. And she probably motivated them to a lot of good things. But there was also the other side of Jezebel. There she accepted sin and sinful relationships. And she encouraged people, hey, you're only human. Hey, everybody does it. Hey, no, hey, there's hell, not hey. We are not to tolerate bad teaching within the church. Somebody say amen. We are not to tolerate bad living. Somebody say amen. And in your personal life, you're not to tolerate things that are are, of compromise that displease our Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. Don't be enamored by people who talk big. You know what we need to be enamored by? We need to be enamored by the people that are humble and have servant hearts. Hallelujah. Remember in the beginning of this book, John, who's the last living apostle who walked with Jesus, the closest one to Jesus. He didn't open the book saying, I'm the last living apostle, but I'm the man of God. I was best friends with Jesus. He opened this book and said, what? I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Don't be enamored by people's rhetoric. Be enamored by their, their lifestyle and their heart. Be enamored by their sacrifices. It says, she leads and teaches my servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality, sexual immorality, and they eat things sacrificed to idols. I don't know what brought this woman such great influence in the church, but Jesus rebukes the church for let her have influence. And especially bringing sexual sins and idolatry into the house of God. This week, I've just been reading Romans, um, the latter part of Romans. I've been reading these chapters over. And this verse, a number of verses just jumped out at me. And it sort of fits. So would it be okay if I read part of my devotion this week? Thank you, Harry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Romans chapter 13, 11, it says this. And you could follow along with me in your Bible or on the screen. It says, do this. It's a very powerful scripture. Do this, knowing the time that the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from the sleep. This is Romans chapter 13, 11. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. Listen to these verses. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly. See how concise these words are. You know, some people think, oh, well, the ways of the Lord are mysterious. No, they're not. He's, he speaks very plainly, okay? Notice he says, let us behave proper, properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife, or jealousy, is there any vagueness in his communication? Okay, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and listen to this, make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. In the back of your Bible, before the book of Revelations, is an e little witty, teeny, teeny book. It's only one chapter, it's the book of Jude. And in verse 3 of this, Jude says, you know, I want to write to you about salvation. I was eager, in fact, and I, uh, but I felt urged to have to contend for the faith. Okay, verse 4, it says, For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you, and they are godless men who change the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus our Jesus." our sovereign and Lord. There are people that come in the church and they try to turn God's grace into an excuse for sin. Let me tell you something. You know what grace is? Grace is a call to the cross to get forgiveness. Hallelujah. But we read last week as the grace of God has appeared to all men teaching us to say no to ungodliness. Grace is never an excuse to go and sin. Hallelujah. Jesus paid for that sin. How could you willfully play around with something that caused Jesus' life? That's not love. Grace exposes our heart. Hallelujah. And it fills us with God's love. It draws us close to him. Going back to this powerful letter, verse 22 of Revelation 2. It says, behold, talking about Jezebel, 
because bringing sin into the church and idolatry and sexual, sexual promiscuity. It says, verse 22, it says, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness. Now, this is Jesus who died for her. These are almost st- startling um, verbiage. Jesus says, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, those who participate in the same acts that she does, I will throw them into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And this is shocking. It says, and I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and will give to each one of of you according to your deeds. So bad is bringing sin into the church that he uses such strong words that should shock us. I'll kill her children. Now, he's not talking about physical children here. He's talking about those who follow in her ways that become disciples of this lady. He will judge them. Let me say this. The judgment before it comes to the world will come into the house of the God. God will have have a holy people. He will have a people that love him. Hallelujah. He will have a bride without spot or wrinkle. And that's what he's calling us to. And if there's ever, if somebody in the house of God, if you hear somebody and they are, they are, are sharing things that are not of God, that, that would lead to compromise or sin. Hallelujah. You stand up and say that will not be propagated here in this house. Amen. Brother Carl, I appreciate you as a worship leader. And I, I know you for years personally. Okay. And you know we're the same way. If there was somebody on that stage with you that was willful in sin, we would not have them worshiping, would we? We would not have them leading this, this, this congregation. Let me say this. If I was in sin, hallelujah, I want you to know I would be the first one, I say this by the grace of God, to, to, to humble myself before the cross and not try to fake it till I make it, but get my life right with God. Can you say Amen. We are, are, are commissioned not to tolerate sin or compromise. Now, how many people know that I love everybody? I'm a lovey-dovey type of guy. And, uh, but let me say this. It's not love to allow somebody to wound the body. And it's only happened a few times, but there were people that we ha- had known were wolves in sheep clothing. And let me just say that it's not about personality. So the, I like this type of personality. I don't like this person, so I'm going to run them off. No, let me tell you something. When they're preaching against the gospel, it's wrong. When they're preaching compromise and sin, it's wrong. So it's not a matter of personality. But over the years, now our church is 26 years, I would say there was probably three or four, five at the most that we'd have to ask people. People to leave because of sin or compromise or be, because they were trying to propagate things that were not of God. And let me just say this, as a leadership in this church, okay, we will not allow somebody to have a voice that we don't know their heart. Amen. Hallelujah. And this church didn't do that, and Jesus had to bring a strong, strong rebuke to them. Hallelujah, and it goes on in verse 24. Now that he just rebuked those who were involved in their sins, and he called them to repentance. He called the church to repent. In verse 24 it says, But I say to you the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold the teachings, who have not known the deep things of Satan as they call them, I like this, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast to I come. Everybody say, no other burden. If you're living right and doing right, that's all there is. Somebody say amen. You're believing right, you're living right and doing right. Hey, Zach, God's not going to ask you, you know, to pick your nose a different way. Let me say that. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> no, God's not going to ask you to do weird things. I'm weird. I'm sorry. I apologize, Zach. You love me anyway. Hallelujah. But no, listen to me. God doesn't have all these weird requirements. Hallelujah. You know, well, how do I know I'm serving God right? Well, you're being kind to your mother. It's Mother's Day next week. Okay? Are you being nice to to your children? Do you mean at work? Are you treating them like you want to, want to be treated? Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. If on the way to church you go to Dunkin' Donuts, you bring the pastor a cup of coffee. Come on. It's not that hard. See me after service. I'll tell you what I like. I'm only kidding. <laughs> Listen to me. He doesn't, he doesn't pile on requirement after requirement after requirement. You just do the right thing. 
And that's what this church was. In fact, they were increasing in doing the right thing. The Bible says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall weep if you faint not. Jesus says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden. You're already heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. Somebody say amen. So he says, you guys are already doing right. Just get rid of this bad teaching that's leading people to compromise. I'm not going to ask you thing after thing after thing. Just do what you're already doing. Hold fast until I come. And it says, he, verse 26, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds unto the end, I will give him authority over the nations. And he shall woo them with the rod of iron as the vessel of the potters are broken to pieces. As I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There's two things you need to overcome. Everybody say, Lord, give me an overcoming spirit. Give me a heart that knows I can be victorious in Christ. How many people know we serve a resurrected king? Amen. You have. The Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. He shall also quicken your mortal body. You have resurrection power in you. You can say no to sin. You can say yes to righteousness. Can you say amen? You can overcome depression. You can overcome fear, worry, and anxiety in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm telling you. It's real. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds into the end, meaning you started doing well, keep doing good deeds. God will give two things. He'll give you authority. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it talks about us ruling and reigning with him. When God created us, he said we are made in his image, and we are to rule over the, the fishes of the sea and the birds of the air. Can you say amen? We were created as human beings in God's image to conquer and to, to control and to rule and to reign in a godly way. And at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, it talks about us being priests and ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And then it talks about him giving us the morning star. Everybody say morning star. Do you know what the morning star is? It's that star when you get up like 6 o'clock and the, the sun's coming over the horizon and you see that one star. How many people have seen the morning star? And how, you know, even though the sun's sort of out, it, that's, you can still see it. It's shining. It, it's really bl- bright. Hallelujah. There's a good probability it's a planet, not a star, but we call it the morning star anyway. It's shining, and it's like really pretty. It's almost like, it's almost like a diamond, you know, against the backdrop of that light blue morning sky. Jesus says, I'll give you the morning star. I've read a number of commentaries, and they all say the morning star signifies something different. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know exactly what it means. Some actually say it's a a symbol of Jesus. He'll give you a diadem. He'll give you something to put on your crown. Hallelujah. That everybody knows. You'll see the shining of Jesus in your very crown that you have on your head. And that might be it. I don't know. But this I do know. That Jesus is the bright and morning star. It says in Revelation twenty two sixteen. it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angels to give you this testimony for the churches that I am the root of the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And I don't completely understand it, but I know Jesus is the bright and morning star. And if I overcome and keep my deeds going strong to the very end, that there's going to be some manifestation of the presence of Jesus. Hallelujah. That forever and ever and ever I'm going to have in my possession the bright and morning star. Hallelujah. I'm going to have, have that relationship with God that, that it's going to be like that bright and morning. Oh, you just walk out in the morning when it's there. It's not there most of the time. Some of the time you could see it. It's just like, oh, it's like a little giddy that happens. You know that? And can you imagine that giddy coming? from that Jesus that's right with you, the bright and morning star.